March 23rd, 1984. This is Joe Tug, an interview with Tom Pate. Mr. Pate, where were you born? I was born at uh, Libby, Oklahoma, November the 10th, 1926. 1926. Who was your father? George Louis Pate. And who was your mother? Uh, Francis Lula Humphrey. What's the last name? Humphrey. Humphrey. H U M P H R E Y. Okay, were they both from Oklahoma? <clears throat> My dad was born uh, near Bengal. My mother was born in Onyx, Arkansas. I guess your father was born in Indian Territory. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 1901. 1901. When did his folks first come here? Uh, 1889. 18, how come they came here? <clears throat> they were, uh, after the Civil War, they left Alabama and uh, they traveled. Uh, the whole family left Alabama and traveled from uh, 1869 to 1889 and part of them split off and uh, went uh, and settled in Tennessee and part of them uh, settled in uh, Phoenix, Arizona area and uh, then the other group came into Oklahoma and uh, some of my great-grandfathers, uh, well, he had three, bro two brothers. My great-grandfather's uh, brothers, uh, one of them uh, settled in the Oklahoma City area. Okay, what was the name of the family that settled at Bingo? Uh, Henry J. Pate. And he was your grandfather? Great-grandfather. Great my grandfather was George Washington Pate. He was Henry Pate in the Civil War? Yes. Blacksmith. Blacksmith. All you, for the South. Did you know him? Never knew him. Hmm. Have you heard any stories about the Civil War? That oh, yes. Mm -hmm. What are some of them? <sighs> well, uh, of course, he was... Uh, now, Henry J. Pate was, uh, he came over as a boy uh, to South Carolina, and uh, he had uh, two brothers, and their name was Reese, and uh, the, uh, his mother met a man by the name of Pate. And uh, shortly after arriving in the uh, uh, United States, the fellow Reese died, and the fellow Pate married her and adopted the three sons. And uh, then this was uh, long about uh, 1830, something long about there. And uh, of course, the, the Civil War came came along, and uh, the uh, the family had more or less uh, gravitated into uh, selling and trading. the The three boys went into service, and uh, Henry J was captured, and I don't know the uh, location of capture. I see he was Confederate. He was Confederate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he was a blacksmith, and uh, he was uh, discharged from the Union forces uh, in uh, 
1865. So he joined the Union Army then? No, from, no, they, he was captured by the Union Army. Okay. See, and he was discharged from a Union uh, hospital, I want to think someplace in, in Illinois. And, you know, he just kind of, you made your own way home, you know, they didn't take you home, but he was discharged and then he came back home. Then after the war, uh, his two brothers and his uh, adopted father, or his father that adopted him, uh, was uh, running a uh, store in Alabama and uh, the times were not good and uh, they were everything was uh, you, if you uh, owned anything you had to almost sit on it to keep control of it and uh, the the four uh, individuals took time about guarding the store and one night there was uh, a group of men who were either a part of the Ku Klux Klan that uh, attempted to rob the store and I don't know which one of the individuals that this was but uh, he killed three of these men and uh, they were in they had the sheets and they were in the guise of Ku Klux Klan members and one of them was a black person the other two were white so he notified his uh, folks and they had a hasty conclusion that uh, if it was the Ku Klux Klan the next morning they'd hang all of them so uh, they got together what they could and the wagons that they had and left that same night. That was in 69? That was in 1869. And that's when they started traveling. That's when they started traveling. And uh, they spent a considerable amount of time uh, down around uh, the uh, uh, Wicks area of Arkansas, which is just over in the Oklahoma line. And uh, uh, my great grandfather was uh, uh, a friend with of William Payne's, and who you know helped settle the Stillwater area. And he was going. How uh, coming uh, to uh, really think about coming to Oklahoma was his uh, correspondence with Payne, and. Uh, is this just William Payne or not David? William Payne? I left, David, I, David Payne. David Payne. I'm sorry, I'm I'm getting back another hundred years. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, he had this correspondence with Payne, and uh, they were going to settle around Stillwater. Well, uh, during the uh, exchange of communication. The, uh, the run of uh, 1889 uh, in Oklahoma came about and uh, they decided that they'd make the run. And uh, uh, my great-grandfather and my grandfather and my great-grandfather's two brothers was going to make the run. And uh, the old man got sick over about weeks and they couldn't make the run and they missed we, they had already made had their application and they had uh, the uh, uh, that was they was already ready to make the run they had all of the paperwork done and they were going to travel from wicks up to somewhere in the northern part of Oklahoma but he got ill and they were unable to make the run and so after uh, the run was over, and along about May or June in 1889, they finally decided to come on over in Oklahoma anyway. And uh, the area was beginning to, the railroads was beginning to come in here for the coal. 
And so they came over here and uh, decided that uh, they'd go to work in the lumber industry. And so they began to uh, hack ties and uh, cut timbers and, and lumber. And uh, then they also uh, got involved in cattle business. How come this, uh, he settled at Bengal? Well, Bengal was a center. Uh, Frisco Railroad went through Bengal, and Bengal was a thriving community uh, in 1890. What was it named after? Can't tell you. I have no idea. And they worked in the lumber industry uh -huh. during Bingo? Uh huh. Okay. And so your great grandfather, Henry Pate, is one that settled at Bingo. Mm -hmm. and, and also my grandfather. Uh, one of them settled on one side of uh, Peachland Creek, and the other one settled on the other side of Peachland mm -hmm. Creek. Now no, they, no, no, Long Creek, Long Creek, Long Creek. Were they both in the lumber industry? Well, my great-grandfather was getting pretty old. Uh, see, this was 1889, and he was born like 1820, uh, I say 1820, probably. And, uh, however, he, he lived till 1907. And uh, but my uh, my grandfather uh, did a little uh, farming, a little cattle raising, uh, and uh, now the other uh, brothers. Uh, no, the other brothers of my grandfather. One of them went to. Um, Oklahoma City area, you know, and uh, one of them went to uh, uh, the area north of Muskogee, and uh, let's see. then one of them more or less just kind of wandered around. He he had leave here and then he had come back and. That's the way he spent his life. Was. Okay. And your grandfather, G.W. Pate, mm -hmm. was basically a farmer? Yes, and a truck farmer, primarily, farmer. Uh, and a peddler. Okay. Uh, he, uh, well, the thing that I remember most about him, he always had something to sell. If it wasn't anything but a, a gallon of uh, uh, green beans, you know, uh, he had something to sell, and he was a, he always had an orchard, had a truck farm, and he, uh, when he, he would usually go to town to peddle his, uh, merchandise, and it was, uh, uh, about three times a week, and he didn't, uh, if he didn't sell anything, he didn't buy anything. And, and that's the way he lived. Mm -hmm. way he lived. Did they have any trouble coming in Indian Territory? Not to my knowledge. They had to get permission to come Oh, over. yes. They had to get, to, you had to get, in order to come over into the Indian Territory. Uh, and to be able to stay. Now, of course, you could walk across the line, but uh, you had to get um, permission. If you wanted to settle in the Indian Territory, you got permission. And, of course, if you wanted to work in the, uh, in the oil, in the gas, coal uh, field, you had to pay a, a head tax to the Choctaw Nation, you know, which was used in their school system. So where did they make application? Was it to Tuscahoma? Probably, uh, let's see, probably Tuscahoma. It would either have been uh, uh, Tuscahoma or Scullyville. Did the federal court ever handle it in Fort Smith? They may have. They may Because that was the federal court for the whole district. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They, they may have. I'm not sure. Okay. Do you have any of that paperwork left about? No, it burned. It all burned. It burned. And uh, the whole thing burned. Hmm. So your grandfather was born in what year? I mean your father, I'm sorry. 
My father was born in 1901. And I do have a copy that I made for a cousin uh, that I'm trying to recover this copy I had given to him. Now that's on the lineage, the family lineage, I'm trying to recover that. Mm -hmm. uh, I will reconstruct the, the, uh, the family tree, uh, but a lot of the uh, original documents I won't have. Okay, and when did your father go in the coal business? Mm, nineteen uh, twenty-five. Mm -hmm. Was Bingo? Mainly a railroad town and mining town. Mm -hmm. Yes, and cattle, mm -hmm. and a lot, of, lot of timber. They took uh, just an enormous amount of ties, you know, out of this, uh, out of this area. And uh, they were building roads, you know, railroads in the western part of the country. And there was an enormous amount of hardwood timber in this country. And uh, what kind of wood makes the best tie? Oh, I'd say uh, white oak probably. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, any kind of uh, oak, rather other than blackjack, is uh, or water oak. But uh, the, what they were primarily using, they were using uh, a red oak and post oak. Some white oak. Okay. And how come he decided to go in the become a miner? The money was better. Uh, he could make five dollars a day, and uh, uh, it just so happened. Now, of course, the, uh, the the mines had been on strike. Uh, there'd been union problems, and on and on and on. And uh, in 1925, uh, this uh, he got an opportunity to go to work at the mine and. Of course, all he was uh, had ever done was uh, just farm, and uh, so he—that's what he did. Mm -hmm. What were the uh, major mines in this area? The names of them. Okay, the uh, the major mines in in the area uh, was uh, this area, of course, was uh, uh, Hadeoli Coal Company. Okay, was that located here at Ludi? Uh, their their office, uh, their main office was at McAllister. Uh, Mr. Haley was the prime mover uh, and the and the developer of the coal company. A lot of the uh, money for the uh, enterprise was uh, uh, come out of the east was Eastern investors, but uh, Haley was uh, the individual who was responsible for the mm -hmm. company. Uh, and of course, Mr. Uh, uh, Tom, uh, well, Bill Elliott was involved in, the, in this uh, venture and uh, uh, gosh, I can't, I can't call this first name's Tom. I can't call his last name. Was uh, the mine superintendent for him? Elliot was part of the time, but uh, hmm. then later, about 1910 and 11, Dagnan McConnell took over the mines west of Wilberton. And uh, Great Western Coal Company owned the mines between Haley uh, and uh, Dagnan McConnell. And those were run by a fellow by the name of William Busby. And sometimes they were called Busby Mines and sometimes they were called Great Western Mines. 
in any of the mines that's referred to as uh, the McAllister uh, and uh, uh, McAllister Coal Company and uh, the uh, uh, Eastern uh, and Choctaw Coal Company, I believe it's Eastern, uh, any of those other names, uh, they, if they occur, uh, they would have occurred before like 1911 mm -hmm. because Degnan and McConnell bought those mines. And this is quite uh, conflicting and, and quite frankly, I've got to get all of this down on paper before I get lost myself. And I do still have a record uh, of this, of the uh, old material. I just got to go research it out. Mm -hmm. And I had all of this uh, laid out, but I've lost that, of course, too. Um, where does it now, the name Ludi come from? Uh, Ludi, <laughs> uh, they don't really know. Probably the community was first named Ola. And uh, the Ola was uh, uh, Bill um, Elliot's daughter's name. And uh, the Haley Ola Coal Company, of course. Haley being the developer of the company. Ola being the location. And that's uh, where Haley Ola Coal Company got their name. But uh, then uh, also they claimed that uh, Elliot had another daughter uh, who was named uh, Ludi, I guess. But I want to think that the, the word Ludi came from Italy and uh, probably Ola was changed to Ludi after the influx of Italian immigrants came in here. And they came, the, uh, the immigrants came in, uh, I got a sister-in-law, her, her father came in here in 1890 uh, from Italy. And uh, he came in to work on a railroad, mm -hmm. a railroad right down there. And uh, when they got the railroad built to Worcester, well, he got an opportunity to go and work in a coal mine, so he came to the word coal mine, and he stayed here, you know, and worked in the mine. There are many Italians still in this area? Good many, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that uh, in the community, in this community, when I was a boy, uh, and well, when the mine shut down in 1930, there must have been, uh, I have documented over a hundred uh, houses on the map in the museum that uh, there was over a hundred families in the community. I would say there was a uh, uh, thousand people mm -hmm. in this area. Hmm. Tell me the history of this little museum up here you had. Okay, the uh, this was one of a uh, oh, hundred company houses is this Haley Ola mine? Haley Ola, mm -hmm. okay. yes. And uh, the, uh, the house was built in 1901, and it was built for uh, the uh, superintendent or foreman, built for the foreman, uh, Tom McAlpin. Is this gentleman's name who was the superintendent of uh, number five, Ludi, and the other mines in the area. Now, this would have been later. This wouldn't have been the first one. And uh, I believe I believe the individual's name was Warren, who first lived in this house. And they had a, a mule yard right right down there. Right across the road? Yes, right across the road and in there just a little bit uh, near where those cows are standing. Okay. And uh, this uh, this mule yard, they uh, are, they had uh, 
for number one, one and a half, two, and three. Those were mines? Those were mines. Mm -hmm. How right. far from the house would those mines be? How far? Uh, number one is about uh, half a mile. One and a half is maybe 30 foot further. Okay. Two is maybe a 30 foot further than that. And, yeah. But they're, they're within a half a mile of the house. <clears throat> the, uh, this, uh, then there was, the miners lived in this uh, house. And, oh yeah, incidentally, they charged uh, $2 a month per room for the house. Uh, this, uh, this particular house was um, one of the better houses that the company built because it was built for a foreman. And a number of the houses were just like two rooms. And uh, that was probably, we've got a picture of one of those out there in the museum. And uh, then they also built a three-room house. I was born in a three-room company house up here on the hill. And uh, of course, there was no no bathroom. It just a just three three rooms or two rooms or whatever four rooms. No Same closets. construction as this one. No, no, no. Some of them were much more cheaper construction. They were just uh, one by twelves with one by four strip nailed over the crack, see, and then a roof over it. The uh, there were now, there were some of the houses that were double wall construction that like this one that had beaded ceiling in interior and then the drop siding exterior. But most of them were just one by 12 boards with uh, uh, one clap by four. Board right. construction. Yeah. Well, they weren't even clapboard construction. They was one by 12 vertical board with what a What do they call strip. that? There's a name for that. Uh, batten. Batten. Board and batten. Mm -hmm. That's the front thing <clears throat> The uh, then the house in 1930 uh, was sold. I believe it was sold in 1934 to Enoch Horn. Mm -hmm. uh, then who was an old miner? And uh, then uh, in 1937, 37? No, no. In 1943, my dad bought the house. Uh, uh, then he died in uh, 1967, I guess. And the house was, uh, my mother rented the house. Uh, off and on, and uh, she died in 1976, and I bought the uh, uh, house and land from uh, my brother and sister, and uh, I go out there one day. I guess that would have been January 77. It was raining or snowing. And um, I'm trying to decide whether to, what to do with the old house. I want to clean it up, you know, clean the area up. And I look at this old house and I can't decide whether it's good enough to keep or, uh, but I'm, I'm just, I've got a dilemma. It's too good to tear up and burn. It's not good enough to keep. And uh, as I wander around, I think uh, this was one of the old Haley Oly Coal Company houses. And uh, then I get to thinking, well, where's, where's another one? And I thought and thought, and I couldn't find another one. So I walked back over to the office and uh, uh, I called a friend who was Tootie Parks. And I said, uh, Tootie? Uh, how many of the old Haley Oly Coal Company houses are left? He said, one. And I said, where is it? He said, you ought to know. He said, you own it. And uh, so I said, well, 
is that the only one left? He said, that's the only one left uh, anywhere in the area, or anywhere. And so I said, well, but I'll just restore the old house. I'll make a museum out of it. So that was in 19, January 1977, and I began to make a list of the old miners to interview and to develop a, a background story. And I worked on that until uh, uh, 1982, and uh, well, 81, we started trying to restore the old house. And uh, I guess if I had known how bad of uh, shape it would have been in, I wouldn't have made the undertaking because it was in terrible shape. But anyway, uh, that's that's the story of it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how come the mines closed in this area? The the mines closed primarily because of the depression, and uh, the the oil uh, became more plentiful and uh, uh, it was uh, cheaper for you know for fuel, and uh, the uh, and of course. There was a lot of problems involved in mining coal, you know. Uh, it was difficult to mine, and it was a dangerous job, uh, and it, it uh, was to some degree expensive. Uh, it was a dirty fuel, and uh, so it just kind of, uh, the competition of oil and gas just froze out the Coal business. The diesel engine to that. Well, this was uh, diesel come in a little later. It did. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, but initially, when the, the coal was froze out, see, most of this coal was used for heating purposes. Mm -hmm. It was developed by the railroads, of course, uh, for the uh, uh, for their power to run their uh, uh, railroads. Mm -hmm. But uh, later as they began to expand the markets, uh, they would uh, sell coal uh, to various towns, you know, supply coal on contract. Kansas, some of it went to Missouri. Mm -hmm. How many miners did the Haley Ola Mine employ? Well, that's a difficult question. I'd say uh, Hey the Old Coal Company at one time uh, probably employed uh, two or three hundred miners. And how many mines are they operating? Oh, maybe uh, at one um, at one time I'm thinking about the. Uh, say three or four. Yeah. Were they shaft mines or slope mines? Uh, all of the Haley Coal Company mines were uh, slope mines, all okay. of them. What's the difference? The shaft mine is a vertical, goes straight down in the ground to the seam of coal. And usually the reason for the shaft mine is, you know, the coal is deep to begin with, you know, the location of the vein. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these, all of these are slope mines and the slope mine uh, just as the terminology indicates, it starts on a slope and continues on a slope. And this, uh, you know, most all of the mines in this area are slope mines. There are two or three shaft mines west of Wilberton, and uh, but they are shaft mines because uh, they had worked the face of the, I mean the upper part of the coal from a slope, and then moved over to the north and put down the shaft and work from the shaft. Okay, so the slope mine, you find the vein of coal and you just follow the vein down? Right, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. How deep were the mines? Uh, number five uh, was about uh, 700 and, I want to say 750 foot deep. I think it's 726, the deepest point. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had some, uh, Oh, it must have been uh, two miles, two and a half miles in length. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that was mined. Uh, the, it had, uh, when you, the main shaft or the main slope went down in the ground and then 
you uh, as you'd go uh, a ways you would uh, go to the right and to the left and, you know you'd mine out this area and uh, all the big with these areas that they mined out uh, well they buried uh, if they got into a good a good seam of coal or vein of coal, uh, they'd work an area like say, uh, oh, 15, 20 foot wide. And if the top was good, you know, it didn't have any problem. And uh, then they'd leave a block of coal for a pillar. And then they'd skip over and they'd do the same thing. And uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, when they abandon this area, uh, they just go in there and pull the timbers out and let it fall in. And uh, sometimes they left the timbers. Uh, usually they would leave these, uh, they'd leave a, a width of track where that they could continue to go on back in a direction and uh, then when when they and they would work this thing all the way down uh, they uh, like say they when they got say a hundred yards back to the right or left uh, they would quit uh, uh, going back in this direction and uh, because it was too difficult for the mule to bring the coal back to the main track, you know, to hoist out. And uh, then they would go deeper. Sometimes the, uh, uh, they might even remove these pillars, but not often, because uh, all of, almost all of the pillars, uh, the coal that was mined here is still intact. Uh, when did they switch from mules to the tractors? They never did. They never did. Never did. The uh, the mules were in the mine, and uh, now some of the coal. Now after 1930, my dad and a couple of his friends, uh, they worked in what's called pigeon holes here on this hill. And uh, as, as a kid, I can remember uh, that that hill just being covered up uh, with pigeon holes and. Uh, now what's a pigeon hole? Okay, a pigeon hole was an illegal mining operation, usually conducted by two or three men who were friends, and they usually mined this coal uh, after dark, and what they were doing, they were stealing it. The, uh, they weren't paying any royalty on the coal. See, the Choctaw uh, had a, uh, you had to pay a royalty to the Choctaw nation and you had to make a bond in order to legally mine the coal mm -hmm. and these folks couldn't uh, it was during the depression and they couldn't uh, they couldn't make a bond they couldn't uh, couldn't hardly eat let alone make a bond and they were they were stealing the coal. Oklahoma cows they talked about dog hole mines same thing same thing, same thing. that's exactly oh, okay. the same thing how come the name's different just oh that's just a different uh, uh, somebody come up with a pigeon hole, someone come up with a dog hole, you know, and uh, it was just a colloquial uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Did uh, the mines reopen in World War II? Yes, now, uh, in World War II, uh, Mr. Pewterball from McAllister Fuel and, mm, I don't remember when, the Fuel and Oil Company, I believe the name of the company, uh, he was instrumental in uh, uh, getting the uh, McAllister, uh, uh, well it was Corbin mine, and the McCurtain mine also, getting those open and uh, that was uh, used in uh, conjunction with the Lone Star Steel Company uh, to uh, furnish fuel to the Dangerfield Steel Plant and uh, the, once again, the coal was made into coke to uh, fuel the steel furnaces. 
and uh, this uh, operation continued until uh, uh, 1960, oh, I'll say in the late 50s. And uh, then the mine, the last of the mines was closed in, uh, I'm going to say the late 50s, and that was at McCurtain because of the explosion. And uh, I don't think there was anyone killed. I think the explosion occurred at night. I believe that's correct. What caused the explosion? Uh, well, probably it was dust, coal dust. But what sets it off? That has to some... Uh, it had to be a spark, you know. Uh, something uh, it's just like uh, what's you know what starts a fire in a house you know in the middle of the night uh, usually it's something uh, some probably an electrical spark probably what set it off mm -hmm. uh, in this case now the, the fire at uh, number five Ludi what caused that was a shot farming fire you know what happened ignited that shot is this one that your father was in yes what happened in that mine. Well, I've heard him tell a story that uh, uh, well, I really don't want to mention names because some of the people are still yeah. their an uh, ancestors are still. I mean, their descendants. offspring descendants yeah. are still living. But <clears throat> there was um, an individual uh, who was uh, firing shots. Uh, knew that there was gas in the mine. See? Now, most of these explosions are caused by gas. Uh, some of them uh, are caused by coal dust. Mm -hmm. And of course, coal dust is, uh, all, uh, is an explosive factor that fuels the explosion, whether it's caused by gas uh, or coal dust. Is this but, methane gas? Yes. yes. Where's that gas come from? <laughs> well, uh, Probably it uh, seeps up uh, from the uh, coal itself, the coal area itself. Yeah. Now we just hit a, a gas well right over here. Most of this gas is rather deep, but they hit this hit a tremendous vein of gas just right over the hill here at shallow depth. So it possibly could have been, you know, some some of this type of gas. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, anyway. The uh, the shot farmer, even the men in the mine, were aware that uh, ten and a half east was a very dangerous area to work in, and of course you, you mean had, ten and a half east. What is? Uh, well, the the main the main slope is it went down here, and then you had a branch that went off this way, and then down a little lower you had another branch went off this way. And then, okay. okay. Now, then uh, you got down here to ten. And you, 10 went that way, and then 11 went that way. But uh, when you got down to uh, uh, 11, uh, 11 went uphill. And when you brought these cars down here, you couldn't, you, the cars wouldn't roll back into the, uh, the room. So uh, somebody got the bright idea, well, let's go up a little ways and cut another slope on an angle. And that's what and they call that ten and a half. Mm -hmm. And it was another entrance to the eleven, number eleven wing going off from the main shaft. Uh, the uh, any any at any rate, the uh, the shot farmer had been instructed. Uh, of course, the the uh, the coal. Uh, safety laws, you were instructed, the shot farmer is instructed not to shoot shots while there were men in the mine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the shot farmer had been, dis had been told to uh, uh, fire these uh, shots uh, at a, a given time, and, it's, and the, the men were in the mine at the time. And uh, so my dad overheard the conversation between the shot farmer, and I've heard him tell this, and uh, to one of the uh, boys of 
his dad was killed in this explosion. I've heard him tell this a number of times to them. And uh, that uh, the argument was between uh, this guy's, the shot foreman's supervisor. He was being told, he said, you shoot these shots, so and so. And he said, uh, you got, we got gas in here. We can't afford to do this, et cetera, et cetera. We've got to get the fans to work in and pull this gas out of here. Uh, we're going to have a problem. And I don't know what kind of mark you involved. But at any rate, the argument ensued, and uh, the fellow was allegedly going to get fired if they didn't go ahead and pull this off. So uh, he fired the shots and set off the explosion with the men in the mine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And you say your father survived yes. the explosion? Mm -hmm. What did he say it was like? What happened? Uh, the happened? only thing he remembers, he just, uh, he, when uh, he heard something, you know, and he looked up and he said it uh, was a ball of fire. And he grabbed his face and fell down on his face. And probably this is what saved his life, is that he saw this in time to, uh, to fall and then the, the force of the explosion went over him instead of hitting him standing up. Where was he when exactly? He was in the middle of the uh, uh, track on the main uh, slope. Hmm. In the middle of the track? Uh, and about, uh, he was between, uh, he was almost down to the 11 east entry uh, on the main slope. Now, is there normally a cave-in with an explosion? Well, there could be, uh-huh, yeah. Was there that time? No. Okay, how many men were killed in that explosion? Fifteen. And how many survived? Two. Two. And your father was lucky enough to... That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he said he survived because he saw it coming and just dropped. Yeah, that's what he felt. That's yeah. what he felt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did he have any protection around him? No protection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that what closed the mine? Mm -hmm. That's what closed it. That closed number five. Uh, now there was uh, number 12 worked some after this, uh, but uh, that pretty much closed out the, uh, the sizable mining operations. Now up until, oh, 32 and 33, uh, there was a little bit of mining took place here. And then uh, in 33, uh, the, uh, I don't believe you can see them, but uh, if the sun was shining just right, you can see some depressions up near the top of that hill. And uh, they had a, uh, uh, government project that come in here and uh, Roosevelt and his uh, make work projects come in here mm -hmm. and they uh, got some of the World War I veterans to take wheelbars and shovels and uh, they filled up all of those old mine slopes and air shafts mm -hmm. with uh, just wheelbars and shovels mm -hmm. and uh, I remember uh, watching them work on that hill. Of course, it all, all, no, it wasn't a WPA project. It was before WPA. The, uh, it must have been seven, eight hundred thousand men working on this. They would just look like a bunch of ants. And uh, they'd uh, dig them out of wheelbar of dirt and take it and pour it in one of those holes. And, and maybe those air shafts would be, oh, they might be a thousand feet deep. That's a lot of, that's a lot of wheelbarrows. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, I think this, if I remember correctly, this went on for about a year, you know. And you still see the scars, you know, on that hill where they got the dirt. But that whole, that whole uh, hill was just uh, honeycombed with the mine holes, you know, and it's dangerous for a kid to get out and dangerous for anybody to get out after dark. You're liable to fall in one of those holes. Any trouble with uh, cave-ins now? Uh, not really. You have still have a little shifting, you know, but most all of the old uh, 
diggings are pretty much stabilized. You know, up at Pitcher up northeast. Yes, you know, yeah. a lot of uh, they do have. Now we do have a little trouble on mine water. Uh, you got in the Narrows, Narrows uh, there at Wilberton, you've got a water mine water problem similar to the Pitcher. Uh, uh, Tar Creek thing up there. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm not chemist enough to really uh, talk about the. Uh, pollution aspect of this, but there is a chemical reaction that sets in when you remove this coal or lead or zinc or whatever, and uh, that uh, uh, sets up and uh, it becomes a pollutant. And that's what the mine water, per se, of what we call mine water, uh, it, it does become a toxic uh, substance. And uh, how you deal with it, I don't know. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, so the, when did the first mine open here? 1901. 1901, mm -hmm. that's when it opened. And uh, was that Haley Ola? Haley Ola. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when did number five close? 1930. That was 1930. Mm -hmm. They were in business here 30 years. Mm -hmm. How far does this vein of coal travel? goes uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Colgate or Lehigh area to Hartford, Arkansas. And how many miles is that? Oh, 150. And what's the average uh, width of the vein of the seam? Uh, it must run anywhere from uh, I'd say 10 to 50 mile, and uh, according to uh, figures, uh, there's been about uh, two or three percent of the coal removed. Hmm. What's the uh, on the slope mine? How wide is the seam? Okay, now it varies. The coal here is about uh, four and a half to six foot. Some of it a little more. But uh, that's about right. Now, at uh, the McAllister area, it's squeezed down to about uh, two to three foot. Uh, as it uh, passes the McAllister area, why it widens out again. And I'd say the probably the uh, uh, deepest vein in the area would be like maybe seven foot. Mm -hmm. um. What kind of, what quality of coal is this? Okay, you got two you got two or three different type uh, coals in the area. Uh, you've got a coal, of course, a, you've got a hard, you've got a soft coal, and then you've got a harder coal. And uh, this coal right in this particular area uh, was a good uh, coal, good coking coal, and uh, but. Uh, it is a bituminous coal, and uh, but it has an anthracite quality. Some of it has an anthracite I was quality say, to it. Uh, mm -hmm. They have a name over by McAllister. They were calling it something like semi-anthracite. Yeah, right, right. Is right. that what they yeah, call it? Yeah, that's what they're calling it. Mm -hmm. And okay. but that, there is two different. There's two different types of coal, but it's not a true anthracite. Yeah. So that's from Pennsylvania. Isn't yeah. It? Right. Is that found anywhere else besides Pennsylvania? Anthracite. I don't know. I just don't know. Okay. Now, if I'm not mistaken, aren't there three grades grades of coal? Oh gosh, there are probably a yeah. number of them. Well, I was in but, uh, my school days. I can yeah. remember they had. Yeah. Well, lignite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that soft coal? Uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Lignite, bituminous, mm -hmm. and anthracite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are they subgraded from there? Yeah. Or? Right. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, sometimes you'll get a, sometimes you'll hit a vein of coal that'll just be full of surf, sulfur. You know, all coal got a reasonable amount of sulfur in it. Yeah. But uh, gosh, I've seen, uh, I've seen coal that just be loaded with sulfur. And uh, but. The grades of coal, of course, uh, all are different. They'll they'll vary from mine to mine. You can even tell the difference in the mine 
I've got some uh, different chunks of coal out there in the, you know, in the museum, and you can tell the difference of the coal from just uh, one area to the next. And usually the cold gets better the deeper you go. It is. Mm -hmm. hmm. Are there any uh, shaft mines in this area? Were there any? I'm not aware of a shaft mine in this area today. Now there's an open mine at Red Oak. You know, pit mine. Yeah. I mean, a, 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 what do you call it? A, yeah. Um, open pit. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what the term is. I don't know what I get call it, but I... Yeah, they do that up northeast Oklahoma, too. Yeah, right. They're those big, um... Drag lines. Yeah. Um... What coal company is that now at Red Oak? That's... Cooper. That's Cooper. Mm-hmm. Strip mining. Correct. I knew I'd think of it. <laughs> okay. When did they first discover coal here? What's well, what's the history Probably. of the mining industry? Uh, coal was first discovered here when the Choctaws come in and uh, uh, began to uh, uh, burn it for fuel and uh, of course they came in here of course they may have been they may have been even uh, may have discovered it when they were on their hunting parties you know before they ever moved into the area but uh, it, the discovery of the coal dates back to the Choctaws as they were using it for fuel. And uh, then uh, the uh, traders that came through, you know, and followed the uh, creeks and rivers uh, noticed the outcropping of coal, you know. And uh, the, the records, uh, uh, the historical records that uh, of their exploitations into the area record the coal veins, uh, I guess, back from the first mm -hmm. uh, exploration that came through here. But the Choctaws started using it uh, for fuel, and uh, then along came uh, the, the railroads, and they, they started using it, you know, uh, for a fuel to push west, you know, with their mm -hmm. trains. Okay. How much of that illegal mining was going on that pigeonhole mine? Oh, I mean, it's, uh, there must have been uh, 10, 15 groups, you know, right here. Yeah. Uh, but they never got out a whole lot of coal. They, they might, now my dad had two friends that worked with him for, they did this for like a year, year and a half, and, and uh, they had, uh, they'd get out uh, three or four times a week maybe, you know, and of course they'd have to, they'd have to sell it and then they'd have to go get it out and uh, it was a terrible hassle. I remember the hassle, you know, it's, you had to work in this thing and not, uh, hopefully not get caught and uh, when it's like like making whiskey really, you had an agent that, uh, a federal agent, when, when he was in the area, why they got the word around and you didn't uh, you know, he didn't do anything. He went and did something else. And when he left and things kind of blowed over, uh, uh, they'd go back to work, and or they might work at night. And mm -hmm. They had a. There was a one fellow down here that uh, had a tax permit, 
and uh, he would buy uh, powder and uh, caps and fuse and stuff and sell to those fellows and uh, they'd go ahead and use it, you know, to mine the coal. A lot of them sold him the coal, you know, and he sold the coal. Uh, a lot of them sold the coal to just the individuals. And so it was a small amount of coal that was got out, you yeah. know, the pigeonhole operation. Okay, how is the museum organized now? Is there a board that runs right. the museum? Or right. How, how's that set up? Uh, I said uh, you're president of the... Yeah, board, chairman board of director. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Uh, the uh, initially, uh, I planned on uh, bearing all of the expense. The uh, I, I I first uh, put out appeals after I got the background uh, material together and got it organized. Uh, I put out appeals for uh, donation of uh, articles and artifacts. You know. The, uh, or a lend, lending of articles and artifacts. And uh, this went over like a lead balloon, and uh, I didn't, wasn't getting any interest whatsoever. So uh, uh, I finally dis discovered or just realized what I was doing that uh, that was the wrong approach. So uh, I decided to, uh, uh, when you want anything done, you get a bunch of women to do it. Mm -hmm. So my sister-in-law worked for me, worked for me for 20 years, and uh, she was uh, president of the business and professional women. So she had worked with me on this thing anyway for some five, six years. And so I hit her up one day. I said, uh, uh, "Wonder if the business and professional women would be interested in helping me, you know, with museum projects." And uh, so she said they might do it. So anyway, I wrote a letter to all of the civic organizations and asked them uh, for the. Uh, for their help you know, on the undertaking, and uh, of course, I you know I was I still planned on bearing the expense, and I did, and uh, <clears throat> then but the response was good, you know, and uh, then when the uh, the women's organizations uh, began to get behind this thing, now the AAUW also uh, contributed in their efforts. And, uh, but the business and professional women primarily, and one thing that tipped me off to this uh, was down Spiro. You know, the business and professional women are instru were instrumental in this thing, see. And uh, also at uh, Colgate, I went through there one day, and uh, I had started this work on this before they did at Colgate, but they had, uh, uh, Colgate had, uh, the business and professional women had bought an old house. It wasn't a mining house, but they bought an old house to house their artifacts in. So that, that tipped me off to that. And uh, so then we got uh, started uh, on this, and we, uh, they worked with me. And uh, so I felt like that we ought to set up a board of directors, you know, uh, to uh, get community involvement. So that's what we did. Uh, I think we've got some nine people on the board, and uh, the only reason that I want to uh, remain in control of it is uh, to see that it that it don't just die, you know. Right. And, uh, Hello. Come in, Neat. Uh, we're talking coal mining. Coal mining. Yeah. <laughs> The uh, uh, three of the members belong to the uh, 
uh, business and professional women, and uh, myself, uh, my two daughters. Uh, one of the members is a uh, uh, an old, well, it's Woodford Park, Tootie Park, and he's uh, he's been a miner himself, and uh, he is uh, associated. Uh, very closely with mine. And uh, then another uh, board member is uh, uh, vice president of the uh, Latimer State Bank. And uh, <coughs> let me shut this off. Yeah. Uh, be done just a minute, Les. Let me see. Did you finish in the board of the museum? Oh, yeah, I think I did. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was going to ask the different jobs in the mine, um, I guess the most dangerous job. Okay. So how the mine was organized yeah. from the superintendent on down. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, you've got management, you know. Uh, and uh, the, the management usually is responsible uh, for uh, getting the coal out. Uh, that's our primary objective. We want the coal and then they go sell it. And uh, of course, they're involved here in the distribution. Now, Mr. Pewterball uh, come on the scene uh, long about uh, 19 and the teens, I'll say. And he was very instrumental in uh, the uh, selling of the coal in this area. Uh, not that the McAllister Fuel and Oil Company sold all of the coal, but because of the organization uh, organizational efforts and his expertise, uh, it, it helped develop the coal uh, field. <coughs> and uh, they, uh, they would uh, get, uh, like say the mayor of St. Louis, uh, come down and say, hey, come down here and look at our coal down here, number five or, uh, or, or at Adamson or somewhere. And, and uh, they'd bring him down here and wine him and dine him and uh, and uh, just sell him on, on their coal. Yeah. And uh, that's the way they sold a lot of it for fuel. That, uh, of course, next was the, the big job was getting this coal out of the mine. And, um, the, of course, you had a superintendent and uh, you worked usually, you know, you work, you could work three shifts, uh, and usually you did, you know, uh, the the coal, of course, was sold seasonally, and uh, there would be periods of time when there was no work at all because there was no coal sold. And but when the coal was sold, uh, man, they they really got with it. They had. <coughs> You had, of course, a superintendent. Uh, then you had uh, foremans or the uh, of uh, different shifts, and uh, they had uh, with each shift. Of course, you had a, a foreman. Uh, you would have to, you had a uh, hoist operator. Uh, you had a rope rider. And uh, which what are these different jobs? What are they entailed? Okay, uh, the rope rider, uh, uh, he uh, he rode the uh, trip, you know, of cars. They might have uh, like say ten or twenty coal cars. Yeah. Does she need some help? Nah. What do you need, Neat? Well. <laughs> okay, we'll start with the rope rider. Uh, he, uh, you've got a, you've got a signal, uh, electrical signal. He touches two wires twice, and that means stop, or once meant stop, really. Uh, two meant start up. Three means slow down, or something like that. And it was just an electrical signal, and you just touch the two wires, and it's set off of you know, like a Morse code deal. Uh, the, uh, he went down with the empties, or mining props, they took mining props down with the empties to shore up 
uh, where they'd taken the coal out. And he just, he dumped these cars wherever, you know, the different people needed the cars. And uh, then he picked up the loaded cars, hooked them together. Now the loaded cars would consist of uh, all different uh, things. Usually you might have just all rock or slate. Uh, maybe it's coal and then you might have slate mixed with coal that had to be sorted. And uh, you might have slack cars, you know, just slack coal or you might have lump coal and it might be mixed. What's and, the difference? Slack coal and lump coal? Well, slack is just, uh, it's coal just crushed, crushed coal. Right. And uh, the, uh, then when he brought, he brought this out on top and then uh, the, he brought it out on what they call a pardon, which is almost flat. This thing is almost flat. And uh, from this pardon, uh, he stops these cars and uh, he can cut, say he cut the back car loose and turn that thing loose and it would go down and then go up and dump on the rock pile. Then he can cut, uh, say he wants to cut another car loose and he'll let it go out on a track and it'll go over uh, to where they're going to uh, uh, go through the shaker where they sort the rock out of it cut another one loose and maybe it goes over here and they're going to sell that one just right off the, the uh, uh, coming right out of the entry uh, and and then these cars they've got another incline that they'll they'll dump them and then they'll turn them loose and they'll all congregate back down here and then after he disposes of all these cars while well, he'll take the end of this hoist rope go down there and and hook onto these empty cars and he'll pull them back up on the pardon and uh, if he wants to uh, pick up uh, uh, timbers or anything well he'll back them off over timber yard and they'll load them on timber yard and he'll pull them back up and they'll go down and back down and do the same thing over and over again <clears throat> that's the rope rider's job <clears throat> And uh, all drawn by mules? No, hoist. They were steam hoist. They were electrical hoist driven by steam. Okay. And uh, now, of course, the pigeon holes, the pigeon holes were uh, the coal was drawn by mules and horses. But now the, the bigger mines, all of the horse, all of the, uh, they were just a, just a big winch is what it was. And it was run by electric motor and uh, the the power was generated by uh, 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 steam. Yeah. Okay. okay? Uh, matter of fact, the first electricity that Wilburton had uh, was furnished from uh, Number Seven, uh, Degnan McConnell, uh, and I believe that uh, that was in 1906 or seven or eight, somewhere along there, in the company. Uh, furnish the electrical service for a Now, the uh, the next job would be the shot foreman, and uh, he uh, what what these guys do? They work and uh, they get all their shots ready to shoot. Now, this come later. Initially, they just everybody went in there and they just shot, shot their own shots, and there were so many people getting killed. You know, till they had to have some kind of law, so. They stopped that, and uh, uh, the shot farman, uh, he, uh, the uh, whoever was in charge, uh, they, they, uh, they had to have someone that done the drilling and the charging of the shots. Uh, this was a responsibility of some individual, and he had to know what he was doing because uh, if uh, if he didn't get the uh, if he got the shot too deep, say that he went through the coal, well, this shot, when it, when it was ignited, it would just blow out of the coal. Wouldn't do any good. Now, if he didn't get the proper amount of energy you know, in the front of the shot, it'd blow out the same way and probably kill the shot farmer, yeah, you know. Right. And uh, so the guy that was shooting this coal, he had to know pretty much what he was doing. He had to know about how much powder to put in in the shot and this sort of thing 
So um, this was a responsibility. Then uh, the, there was other uh, fellows that worked in the team that they just shovel coal. And uh, I asked my dad one time, you know, this song, I shovel 15 ton. And I asked him, I said, uh, uh, did you ever shovel 15 ton a day? And he said, uh, I hope to tell you I've shoveled 15 ton a day. He said, if you didn't shovel 15 ton a day, you starved to death. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he said he had shoveled over 20 pounds a day a lot of times. Um, one of the old miners at McAllister said they had curtains. Yes. Now, a curtain, a cu the purpose of the curtain uh, was, uh, uh, you know, you've got to have air, you know, in this mine. And, and as you go down here, you sink this, you begin to sink this shaft. This is a lead shaft, see? And then down from the top, you drill a hole, see? That's ventilation. Right, and then this fan, it either it either forces air in and forces air out somewhere else, or it pulls air out and forces in somewhere else. Now, <clears throat> the curtains, like, uh, uh, say that uh, this is the slope, this is the mouth of the slope, okay. all right? now. You won't say you've got gas, let's say, in number five uh, west, back this way, and you've got gas in there. Well, now, this is a pocket of gas, and this is trapped. See? Okay, you close this curtain off at the mouth. What's the curtain made of? It's usually just bur uh, 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 burlap canvas. Or canvas. 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 Heavy, you know, it had to be weighted, you know, and uh, it was just a barrier is all it was. And uh, so you you close the mouth off, and you closed up the other different entries, you know, the where the air could seep in, and then you tried to exhaust this gas from this area. Yeah. We'll get on that thing. Let me see. Forcing the air out with the curtains. Yes. Right. I think basically that's. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a lot of times they use. Uh, uh, just a boy to operate the curtain, see. A what? A boy. Okay. You know, Trapper. He, Trapper. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's and, what they call them, yeah. Trapper. Mm -hmm. Trapper. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had, a lot of times he'd do that. Well, I think we have, oh, how bad was your father injured in that explosion? Uh, very seriously. Uh, burned. He was burned. And, uh, he was unable to do anything for a year and a half. Uh, <clears throat> I remember, just as a boy, I remember uh, uh, he was on some kind of sheets and uh, uh, of a morning for the first few days, I don't remember how many days, uh, the uh, when they would uh, turn him over and remove this sheet, mm -hmm. uh, this thing would, uh, it was had some kind of rubber material in it or something, but it would just be uh, drawn up and uh, like it had been on fire, it had been heat, the heat, and uh, the heat in his body, apparently, I, I, I don't know what else to, Alleged, and that, that don't even make sense. It would happen, but uh, nevertheless, the uh, for some reason or other, this uh, sheet when they change the sheet in the morning, uh, this uh, would appear to be cooked. Hmm. And I, I don't know. I know that that defies all kinds of logic and everything. So, uh, but maybe I just remember it as a kid being that way. Maybe it wasn't that way at all. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's fine. Thank you. We're going to town.